Welcome to our second episode of Creative Conversations. My name is Morgan Appel. I'm the Assistant Dean for Education and Community Outreach at the Division of Extended Studies at EUC San Diego. And today joined by Gabriela Delgado from San Diego County Office of Education. And today we have a very special guest, um, Dr. Tony Smith, who serves as the Deputy Superintendent of Innovation for the San Diego County Office of Education. I could think of no one better to kick us off, Gabby. Absolutely. So welcome, Tony, to Creative Conversations. We are so excited to have you uh, join us and, and lead us in, in wonderful dialogue. And I know you're going to share a little bit about yourself, but I do want to say, Morgan, that it's important to let our viewers know that uh, Tony Smith bleeds blue and gold as he is a proud alumni of UC Berkeley, having received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD. So I want to start off by saying he is a proud, proud golden bear. And so for all of our, our listeners, I think that's an important note to, to start with. But Tony, just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll, we'll get started. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. And uh, Morgan, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, definitely go Bears right out of the gate, uh, Gabby. Um, I also played football at Cal, so that's another part of that whole story. Um, and then ended up uh, getting to teach and coach there was uh, a real blessing. Um, so I was born in California, born in the Central Valley in Stockton. Um, actually, uh, my parents were teenagers and then not together, so I kind of grew up all over and with uh, many different families and really had... Uh, an experience of being kind of cared for through the public school system. And uh, my journey through public schools in California really prepared me to both take responsibility and leadership for creating better conditions for kids and families in the state. And uh, so I feel really fortunate to be here at this time. And, and I will echo support for the Bears. I grew up in Berkeley, actually, just a, a little bit of my, about a mile away, a small town called Albany during the 1980s. And much of my wayward youth was spent on the Cal campus and on Telegraph Avenue. And uh, both of my parents were actually um, faculty at UC Berkeley. So I do have a real affinity uh, for the campus and, and know that, that you um, come out of there with a, a, a wonderful, uh, robust set of experiences and knowledge. And uh, Dr. Smith, I'm hoping that you might shed some light on your position as a Deputy Superintendent of Innovation. What is that all about? Yeah, the, the approach to innovation that, that we are taking is, is that the, the, the big idea about innovation is really eliminating bias and creating opportunity. So in every context at all times, systems are playing out that privilege some and, and cost others. And so how and in what ways can we create conditions that eliminate bias and produce more opportunities for young people and their families to flourish and thrive? And so, you know, that is in the tech environment, it's in design, it's in how we engage and do outreach, it's in kind of our personal inquiry and kind of checking our own understanding. So the, what we've been doing in the innovation team is really building kind of skills, habits, and dispositions around um, thinking about inclusive design, universal design for learning in all contexts. And so beginning with deep respect for the, the wisdom, the local wisdom of kids and their families and thinking about how school and learning environments that are more formal can actually take uh, a broader perspective about the learning that kids are doing all day, every day, everywhere, right? That, that how we care for the whole child the whole day would really be a transformative experience. And as, as Paul, who is our county superintendent, really talks about that if, if all of our children are well, our county is going to be in a much better place. And, we're not there yet. And so we've got to look at the way systems are producing the outcomes that we're seeing and we have to tune and change those systems. So being a deputy superintendent of innovation is really about the system design work and, and thinking about the, the ways in which we've both concentrated poverty and concentrated privilege. And we've got to really think about the approaches to redesign a system where if, if everybody 
is doing better, everybody is doing better. And we've got to kind of take that into both um, really close in conversations, content conversations, policy. Um, that, so that's the approach uh, that we're taking and that's the job I've been asked to do. And, you know, Tony, in reading and learning a little bit about you, I came across an article that said that one of your approaches to education is through a lens of curiosity and listening to be able to create the specific conditions that are needed. And so maybe you could just walk us through when we're looking at the climate that needs to be able to sustain and be ready to accept this change. What what does that look like? What is needed to be able to have that space um, so that students, like you said, can and are able to thrive? Yeah, I think the the first place I start with that, Gabby, is that the, that at this point in our history, that in, in a, a mature, wealthy democracy, that um, poverty is really a, a policy choice and that exclusion is a choice. And so how we take responsibility for listening to the lived experience of, of people and, and really not listening so that we can convince them of something else, listen to understand both the, the joy and the, the possibility, but also the constraints on, on what they are experiencing and to, to really partner deeply with people in their context to create conditions for their own well-being and thriving, right? So um, expanding this circle of concern and, and saying that everybody deserves to belong uh, is an approach where, and I, I have kind of come to think of it as listen, engage, align, and deliver, so lead. And by listening deeply and being in relationship with people, um, not starting from what I know, listening to learn and that curiosity to me curiosity is the key uh, they, uh, because I if I start by telling you what I already know about you it doesn't create the conditions for me to learn more right I mean it's already sh- constraining and shutting down so listen engage is that checking for understanding the back and forth the dialogue right the like I thought I heard this is that what you meant uh, this is kind of that connects to my past experience and that sound a little bit like, so you engage and that's the dialogic engagement, right? Um, and align. So then I bring particular experiences, gifts, talents, abilities. I need to align those to what I've heard in a way that will potentially increase that opportunity. And then the leadership dimension is deliver. Like I have had the opportunity to be in some positions of decision-making and moving systems. So how I take action and deliver on that um, possible shift to create more opportunity, eliminate bias, that's the leadership move. But it is deeply connected to where people are, not my vision abstracted from lived experience. That leadership has to happen in situ with people for you know, their own well-being and how do I contribute to that so that we expand that circle of concern? You know, I, I think it's so very interesting, uh, Gabby, that, that you, you, you raise the issue of climate and climate change. Uh, Dr. Smith, you have spoken compellingly about systems approaches. And I think that we do find ourselves in systems that are deeply entrenched, l- long-lasting, dating back centuries and labyrinthing. And, uh, you know, in our last series of, of creative conversations, we thought that, you know, during the worst of the pandemic, that this would be the catalyst. This would be the shot that heard was heard around the world. And we would finally see a lot of change emerge from that. People were suddenly sort of uh, waking up up to that. So I'm really curious about a few things. Number one, we are here in, a, you know, and I know you've been in the, in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area certainly has um, a variety of interesting qualities, but San Diego is really a unique as a regional um, sort of uh, border culture. Uh, we have really a an interesting context by which systems can be explored and, and wondered a lot about your thoughts about being in San Diego and does that lend itself uh, to looking at systems differently? And uh, 
you know, this uh, context of community and meaningful community involvement as shared participants. Yeah, the ge- geography of San Diego County is, is really interesting and important to talk about. And, and Paul and the County Office of Education and the board have really said a, a future without boundaries. So the future without boundaries approach is, is much more about our human and humane interactions and how and in what ways we kind of take action that inures to the benefit of each other and, and that this idea that we belong to each other while we are um, actually encouraging each other to diminish difference and the boundaries. That said, we live in a very bounded space, right? That the, to the south of where I am right now, the border and to the west, the ocean, to the north, Camp Pendleton, and to the east, the desert and the mountain. Like, we are geographically constrained in some ways, pretty uniquely. Um, and, and to think about the county, the roughly 500,000 children and students and families a, as a broader ecology. And, and, you know, you talk about ecological design, Sim Vander, and you talk about Richard Register and, and ecological design in Berkeley. Um, that if we take the idea that we belong to one another and we need to create systems that are in fact, you know, creating a common floor but no ceiling, that there's a, a way in which housing, healthcare, education, everybody deserves a level of care and being well known, well cared for, well prepared, that we need to think about the, the broader ecology and those resources and distributing them and sharing them and fortifying them so that every child and their family has access to that quality experience from healthcare, housing, education. And then that literally creates a different kind of experience for all of us. You know, so to say that we have a unique opportunity, I think is real because of the, geogra- the geography, but also politically, it's very purple. I mean, the people have a, a broad range of philosophical views and opinions, and they're expressed politically in the county in really unique and important ways. I happen to believe that good ideas don't reside in either party or at either end of the country. They reside across. And so how do we stay in dialogue and in relationship to learn with each other? I think the public school system is the best place to do that and in fact uniquely positioned to coordinate align and leverage all of the other resources and opportunities in in broad systems so you know i i think geography is a really important piece and simultaneously this notion of a future without boundaries and how that plays off of each other um, and how we support that and and to your point tony i know you've had a lot of previous experience working within and advocating for that community schools model, which we know has been around for quite some time, um, but sometimes we're, we're a little late in that full implementation across the board. And so I feel like, to your point earlier, Morgan, that there is a shift that we are starting to, to see and possibly even beginning to feel in education. And so I'd love for you, Tony, just to talk a little bit about your experience and and let our audience know what is that community schools model really about and what has been your your experience and lessons learned from from your work in different communities. Yeah, I appreciate that question very much. The community schools work uh, has been really important to me. Um, I think both from how I grew up and the idea that, you know, there but by the grace of God go I. Like People showed up and took care of me in lots of different ways. Um, and, you know, I've I, I am literally not sitting here without the good and kind intervention of many, many people. Um, so as a, as a lived experience, a community school model makes a ton of sense to me because <laughs> I wouldn't be here without that. Uh, but historically, um, going back to the Mott Foundation in the 1930s, the lighted schoolhouse, the idea that, hey, we've got this covenant, like these public buildings have been built with public dollars how and in what ways are they always strengthening the surrounding community, neighborhood, you know, how are parents, families connected to the school, uh, you know, moving into the, the beacon model in New York City and, and Richard Murphy 
was an important mentor of mine um, who did the, the beacon work in New York City and really kind of coached me up on, on how to think about creating those linkages between systems. And New York City has a deep history, of course. They're making a Benjamin Franklin High School. It's a great book. And that kind of, you know, educating like democracy and civics matter. Like the idea that the life of a school can strengthen the well-being of the entire community is really kind of in the center of a community school's approach. Um, we took that, did I think some really important work in Emeryville and Oakland. We were kind of known as the first district-wide community school approach. So, so we became a, a community school district, not just a district of community schools. That's an important distinction. Um, and now, you know, with $3 billion allocated to this idea in California alone, and it being one of the planks of the president's, um, President Biden's platform around education, community schools, you know, I think, I think California is well positioned to be a community school state. And I think this idea that we coordinate, align, and leverage, Cal, <laughs> um, go Bears, uh, that we coordinate, align, and leverage all the public, private, and philanthropic assets for the well-being of children and their families, like that fortifies community. And if we can recenter that everybody that's in a community, the public school is a place to, to engage, debate, uh, and to really push hard on ideas while we deepen a relationship with each other across difference. I mean, California is one of the most extraordinary places in the world. And if we take a community school approach statewide, I think we will make a big difference. Um, you know, I, in the time, so I left California, I left the superintendency in Oakland. Uh, my wife's family, parents got very sick. We left, we went to Illinois. I had a chance to become the state superintendent there after a couple of years. Um, and, you know, we, we put forward this healthy community incentive fund. We started to kind of think different about connecting all parts of Illinois. We changed the funding formula. But in some ways, this community school approach in California could be one of the most transformative and radical moves, I think, ever. Because in the time I've been gone, it's like $48 billion more in education and improvement hasn't really happened for all kids, in particular those kids that have been most harmed by the system as it is. You know, money doesn't buy improvement. Relationships deep support for educators, for community members, for the out of school time space, you know, connecting out of expanded learning, like changing the conditions changes outcomes. You know, just putting more money in the budget doesn't get it done. So I think this idea of a community school state, a community school approach it is a very, very significant moment. One I'm obviously very excited about. And, you know, I, I want to revisit uh, this issue of education as a public trust, because um, you more than anyone else know that um, institutions like the University of California are moral act institutions um, that have not only a, a legal obligation, but a moral and ethical obligation to attend to the needs of our communities in a way that's strengths-based and, and reciprocal. And I'm wondering, um, has what we learned from the pandemic, or maybe what we've learned from the experience of community schools and others, has that changed fundamentally our ability to have informed conversations about education where everybody speaks the same language, albeit in a different dialect? So where do you see communities participating? Well, how have their roles changed? Parents, caregivers? Two things about that. So one, the, the blueprint, I think the initial blueprint and the even... So the University of California system, uh, I think, is uncommon and, and amazing. And just that infrastructure, uh, how does our collective learning support the public good? You know, I, I think we have not always invested heavily in the public infrastructure. And, you know, I think the common good requires uncommonly good public systems. And that idea that you have to run a public system with a, with a deep discipline and care that includes multiple voices that isn't, doesn't become so bureaucratized that it tells the public what it needs to be, that it actually continues to ask and be in relationship with 
and takes its lead from the needs and, and vision of community. But see, that kind of relationship is, it, it's not simple. It's not, it's not a complicated problem. It's a complex problem. It's one that's not linear. It is one that is all the, all the time changing. And what it relies on is deep integrity. And I don't think we as public officials and public servants have always behaved with that kind of integrity. And, and that moment that we're in right now, this kind of public reckoning, is how do we actually have deep trust in one another? How do we build that trust forward that we can create public infrastructure, public systems, where everybody can participate? And, you know, unfortunately, we're in some pretty tense public discourse. We have district school boards and superintendents that are, you know, kind of under siege, uh, but I would say the answer to that is to get in relationship with people. Like the deep care, people want their kids well-known, well-cared for, and well-prepared. That's universal. They want fair, they want secure, and they want good. <laughs> so how do we go about doing that and, and stay committed to learning? Um, you know, we need science more than ever. We need people to actually deeply engage in the scientific process and inquiry. We need people who can communicate. We need people who are learning languages. We need, like this future of no boundaries requires deeper learning than ever. And I would suggest we also have to get much more towards competency rather than seat time. Like we, we measured learning by time. And you know, if you're, if you're measuring seat time, you're measuring the wrong end of the kid, like I think. <laughs> so we gotta get into the idea that kids are creating, doing, things that we need to have count for that learning and, and using new technologies like blockchain and other ways, we have to push the envelope and sometimes public systems are slow to do that and are actually much more reproductive than transformative. So I think inside of this tension of you know this moral imperative, sometimes it can be a little self-righteous and we've got to kind of take a step back and say, what would a healthy California look like? What would learning for all of our children and families look like so that California is in fact a community school state, that we are actually deep respect for locals around some common visions of, of a state leading the way for the country and the world, I think. Um, so anyway, that's the stuff that I get excited about and then thinking about the, the conditions piece. And I know Gabby, we've talked many times and with our, our colleague uh, uh, Lisa Davis about the importance of moments, the, the importance of seizing opportunities, although sometimes you only know it was a moment in retrospect. Yes. One of the, um, the words that you used earlier, Tony, that resonated with me was radical. And I, and I thought, because you're right, it's this radical idea that we are going to shift. And we've talked about this, Morgan, right? That the pandemic opened up the ability to have those conversations about doing things differently. And then here we are thinking, okay, two years have gone by, we're now in the endemic state, and are we really doing things differently? But when you said that word, Tony, part of me thought, how is it that we can ensure that we don't default to, this is the next trend, this is the latest initiative, so that the folks who we know we want to have their voices heard and be be listened to, that they are open to the idea. And sometimes when we've invited folks to have a seat at the table, it hasn't been comfortable at the table. And so although a seat may be created, it doesn't still give you the 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 um, the comfort to speak up and really be authentic. And so so how do we say this is a radical movement, but then how do we create it safe for those folks to really truly engage um, authentically? All right, do we have like five hours for this one? <laughs> <laughs> Give us the Cliff Notes, yeah. the Cliff Notes <laughs> version if possible. Uh, well, there's a part of this that is deeply about transforming relations of power and that the idea of inclusion, people have been so committed to inclusion, however, Inclusion still suggests that there's an existing frame and I know what it is and I'm going to include you rather than 
a, a belongingness frame, which is much more ecological, back to the ecological design piece, and kind of more of a, um, of a reef approach. Like, as, as the reef changes and things join, that the entire ecology of the reef expands and shifts. Like, that understanding of, I know what I know until I learn and, and, and am introduced to something else. Like that, that our certainty has to be in question. Like the more certain we are, the more concerned we should get. Like <laughs> that, that we actually have to have some awareness, things that we believe and be open to the learning, that curiosity piece. Um, so expanding the table it's like with, with young people, right? It is not, I don't think, so I statement, I don't think it's about kind of making sure that they show up like many adults when they are in public places speaking. Like young people are leaders and they know things in their context. How do we have a place where we listen to what young people are saying? We don't tell them, well, in this place, you have to talk like this in this way. Like, that we strip down and pull off and mute their message so that it's comfortable for the adult listener. Young people are seeing and experiencing the world in their way. Our charge is to learn that way, not to tell them that their way is inadequate and hasn't yet reached our way. Like <laughs> The adolescent development is a, people are like, you know, you just got to endure it. Um, well, we just have to help them get through that. Adolescence is a beautiful, incredible developmental phase that we should spend more time learning about, right? So, you know, neurologically, like all these developmental phases, like we need to get smarter about what development is and what it looks like and the whole continuum and not kind of get locked into kind of adult centric spaces or you know, in, in terms of even how we invite community in, telling community how they have to behave in a meeting when, you know, there might be kind of a white dominant discourse, there might be a, a maleness to the frame. Like, we need to just open up these spaces so that we can learn together. Um, and I think that's, that's the horizon for California. Like, if, if we're going to come together to be this, and I'm kind of coming back to this idea, I hadn't really thought of it before, but this community school state, like if we're actually activating, connecting, and have an array model up and down the state of communities that are finding ways to activate learning for their kids, and that expanded learning space is, is much broader than the school, but it gets consolidated in schools, like we could we could literally be kind of moving the needle for the for the world around learning and well being, um, but that's going to take a different stance and different kinds of leadership, I think. And 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 I think you know a, a lot of what you're saying rings true when I when I think of everybody sort of having to move home as a result of the pandemic. We saw that adolescents, particularly were very well adjusted to the technology, although the sort of socio-emotional aspect, you know, this sort of really interruption of routine was was difficult. But, you know, we all had a shared experience. We were all, well, I mean, shared in the broadest sense of the word. And we all seemed to be operating on adrenaline. And I think we thought, all right, so here's the flashpoint. Here's the flashpoint of the revolution. Here's the flashpoint of the reconstitution. And then I think, Abby, you mentioned we've seen people sort of sliding back into routines that are comfortable, that, that feel safe, maybe a bit of a departure from what we might have expected. But I'm wondering, um, uh, Dr. Smith, if there are any pockets of innovation that you are encouraged by, that you look at and go, that is it. Now, I know community schools, certainly, but are, is there anything else that really says, okay, we are moving the needle. Yeah, I, I think the the piece you raise about the the well being of young people, so the the mental health and the you know we have heard about the crisis and seen close up the this the connection, the connectivity, the idea of young people being deeply connected and in community. That that's an important part of 
adolescent development. Um, you know, you're you're trying on identities, you're you're testing ideas, you're trying to figure out, um, you know, what what you believe, <laughs> and so kids and young people do need community and interaction uh, to to actually come to know themselves. Um, Daniel Kahneman actually talks about the, in Thinking Fast and Slow that every human brain is blind to something and we're blind to our own blindness. That's why we need each other. To actually know ourselves more deeply, we, we need the other. We need other people to help us know ourselves. And I think that approach to me is, is really fostered in much more of a competency based. And we have like Lindsay, there are some districts in California that have moved to much more learner centered and saying, you know, high standards, high expectations, and how you demonstrate that knowing is, is important and can be unique. So have common high standards, common clear expectations, but realize that everyone is situated a little different. And we're situated different in a system that has really supported some, you know, concentrating wealth and concentrating poverty. So across that system, people are situated in different ways. So we need those common high expectations, but then we need to target support in ways that meet people where they are and ask them what health and well-being looks like, right? And so I think competency-based learning and those systems are really important and you know there are like um cone valley we, ha we have some really good examples of people who are thinking different about relevant learning like the the community as as a as the classroom and that schools help kids say you know here are some of your strengths you know here's something you're passionate about you know and kids starting to say hey i'm interested in this it and then this particular experience, I built skills. I'm now in relationship with people that care about the same stuff. Like, that's what we should be doing much, much more of, you know, kind of interest, skills, and relationship rather than just a, a fixed canon, a fixed set of content that we kind of shove down kids' throats and tell them to regurgitate. Like, that, that time is far past. And I think places that have recognized that and you know, even the, the National Superintendents Association, AASA, last year put out this vision of the future, which is very much a community-connected vision, but around competency um, rather than seat time. And that, 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 to me, is the horizon. How we actually start creating conditions for kids who are doing this learning in real places, you know, apprenticeship models, legitimate peripheral participation, Gene Lave was uh, a very important uh, mentor of mine at, at Cal um, and kind of this notion of legitimate peripheral participation and apprenticeship. I do think in some ways that's a very old notion, but we have so many more tools now to, to make it global, to have, you know, learning and doing um, asynchronous language learning. You know, we, we can do all kinds of stuff internationally right now and I think kind of thinking about the school as a sacred place of this covenant to consolidate that learning, but it's not where all the learning happens. Um, and there are some places that are doing that kind of work, uh, and that's pretty exciting to me. And it's really redefining the covenant. And I think we, I would be remiss if I didn't state that post-secondary education also struggles with these same types of things. And um, again, our, our systems are pretty deeply entrenched as well. Yeah, and you know, I was just um, reflecting on what you were sharing, and I and I thought, you know, that speaks to who I am as a as an educator and who I am as a person. So I I naturally would gravitate towards these ideas, and why I would gravitate towards Morgan and Lisa when we have these dialogues around. We have to reimagine learning. We have to reimagine education. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I think that's where there's also some fear for mm -hmm. for those of us in the field because it's the unknown or I almost like when we were thrown into this pandemic and you had to do learning and teaching in a very different way and it was very unsettling for a lot of folks so even this this idea that 
we know what's best for students. We know that surrounding them with a holistic approach is going to help them become young, um, you know, vibrant, thriving young adults. But the fear that I think a lot of educators and community members feel is very real. And in hearing you, part of me was thinking the components that seem present in your work stem a lot from having a level of humility that I don't think is often practiced um, or that we just haven't seen. And so it, you know, I was taken aback when you were um, kind of walking us through what that work had looked like for you. And I thought, but that's because you are able to bring that style of leadership and people would follow. And so I, to your point, Morgan, earlier, where it's like, did we reach that tipping point? And, and we are at those crossroads where we, if we do not reflect and really take this opportunity and seize it and practice that humility as people that we don't know everything. And maybe the way we've done it, maybe we need to let go of some of that and say, well, what could it be if we just looked at things differently? So, Tony, if you had you have different audiences, but if you had those folks in the room who thought, I, 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 I'm, I'm too scared to take that leap of faith with, I'm, I'm just not quite there yet. How do we get those folks on board to understand that um, it, it, it could be something different if we just allowed ourselves to reimagine it for a minute? There are a few different ways I want to go with that, but one is really just to remind people to treat each other as human beings, like to, to move away from pretense. There's so much that happens. You can talk about humility, but I do think the way the system is structured, that people work so hard for things they care about, but they have to behave in particular ways in the system as it is. And that because it doesn't prioritize relationship, the the further out of relationship people get, the more reliant on the rule they become. And that becomes the answer rather than staying deeply with people to solve human concern issues, right? Um, so again, these ideas aren't new. Like we talked about like, you know, community schools in the 30s and mod, but also 1968, uh, the Kerner Commission after like extraordinary civil dis you know unrest across the country, the education section of the Kerner report, 1968, talks about using computers, talks about community relevant education to actually start to break down the barriers to to provide conditions for every child to get the support that they need. At some point, the ideas are good ideas, but they're about the choice that we make about who deserves our care. And I think, Gabby, just to keep it real, for me, I, yeah, I, I don't forget where I come from. I mean, I, I, am, I am, quote, those kids. I, and I've been, you know, as a football player who was an English major and like, well, you, why, what are you doing in this class? Like, I've always kind of been in, people's assumptions and stereotypes I've experienced deeply and I didn't as a kid I didn't have clean clothes I had sweats and I wore all the time and showed up in a different school and yeah you know, I um so I, I just think we just have to remember that we're all going through things in this life and the more we know each other's story and the more connected we become the more opportunity we can see um and I mean, it sounds really touchy feely, but I do believe back to this conditions piece, we can create conditions where we prioritize relationship and well being. It's not just for kids around interests, skills, and relationship, it's around adults. Like, how do we design spaces where people, their, their why, their personal why is getting activated and answered while their professional why? so they can take care of their families, they're economically, socially, and civically secure. Like, th that's action that we all need to be taking, and I, I think public education is a space that is kind of the fulcrum for housing, healthcare, business development. I mean, a kick-ass K-12 system is your primary workforce development agency. 
I think. <laughs> I, and higher ed, you know, to your earlier point, there is kind of a reckoning. Like, you know, what, what credentials, you know, how much, what's the value proposition of higher ed? How, you know, competition, high profile degrees, you know, I do believe Berkeley is the most extraordinary public institution in the world. Um, and, and we need to have that much more available and much more democratized. And how open to that transformation is higher ed? I mean, again, these are choices. And, and I think we've just got to be making those choices centered on the whole child the whole day. Like, how do we benefit and inure to the benefit of children by our choices? Um, but that's, that's, as an educator, that's, that's what we're, I think, what we're supposed to be doing. You know, Dr. Smith, you, 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 you talk about credentials and value propositions. I think we are all very much cognizant of the real need for classroom teachers, that there, there is sort of a generational changeover um, where you have incoming educators who may really glom onto their sort of intuitive pedagogical artistry, their instinctual teaching left somewhat unfettered by teacher education programs. So I'm wondering, what message do you have to those who come into our profession as educators, um, what do you? What would you? What message would you like to send to them as they embark on this journey? The first piece is just thank you for everything you have been doing, and a deep appreciation for teachers and school administrators, people really connected to the public school system over the last couple of years. It's been as hard a time as I've seen ever, and just the the fortitude to keep showing up for kids um so just deep appreciation but i i also think that more than ever the the part of the teacherness is to see in young people things that they haven't yet seen in themselves and and to be the teacher of a young person not the teacher of a subject right that that the relationship and herb cole used to talk about uh, he would say, I, I don't know what, you, I don't care what you know until I know you care. And the, the re-centering deeply on care and personalization, and not just personalization by kind of what's interesting to you, but your lived experience, group identity, but then what is in particular interesting to you, to really go back to the, the relationship that we want to have uh, between teacher and students to create the conditions for learning. And, you know, learning is a social engagement, a social activity, and how you create those in conditions. Um, and Linda Darling-Hammond talks about the, the culture of revision and redemption. Like, the best classrooms are places where kids are trying stuff. Like, because, I mean, learning is disequilibrium. Like, learning necessarily means I didn't know it before. And so there's all kinds of identity stuff tied up with that. Like how, how comfortable have you made it for people to say, oh my God, I didn't know that and now I do. Like talking about what you don't know can be really scary, particularly cross race, class, gender, all kinds of difference. Those environments in classrooms that are truly just make it possible for everybody to talk about their own learning. What I didn't know, I used to think and now I think. And how we do that as adults, how we create the conditions, um, you know, every single human brain, this is David Rock's work, but status, certainty, UCLA, uh, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, like e all of us respond to those things. So how as educators are we creating the conditions for our human being to be, you know, oxytocin, to be in a positive state, a learning state? So I would just talk to educators about, you know, it's time to be even more human and humane than we've ever been to get to justice and, and more equitable outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's the neuroscience of persistence that we often talk about. Exactly right. Exactly. I, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am um, that you've taken some time to spend with us on, on creative conversations. Um, it's really caused me to, to rethink about the climate for education, not only 
in K-12, not only in expanded learning, but also in, in post-secondary. Um, Gabby, any final words? Just, you know, Tony, I appreciate your time and I, I value your input, but um, above all, I, I've known you just a, a short amount of time. I would say I, I am just, you are a breath of fresh air. And so I just appreciate your way of being and I appreciate your compassion and the fact that you you are a listener. And so I, I, I thank you very much for that and um, sign me up. However, I can jump on board and and be a part of it. Um, I want to do it. So thank you. Thank you so very much for being here. Well, Gabby, thank you for the invitation. And already just the relationship um, that we've built, I, I would say back to you that you've, you've made it easy for me to show up and really supported me in the transition. And uh, Morgan, you know, thank you for the opportunity to be on today. And I think maybe closing with just, it, it's an idea that, Dr. King and others put forward, but beloved community. They, it seems to me more important than ever that we actually talk about creating beloved community and what is that work so that everybody truly belongs. Um, every kid deserves to have that experience of belongingness and their family too. So I just think the design thinking that we've got to do is around belongingness. And I think every single child deserves that. And uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation. Yes, thank you. So San Diego, Tijuana region, um, let your spirits be buoyed. Our climate is changing and changing for the better. Uh, Thanks to you, Dr. Smith. And on behalf of Gabby Delgado, Lisa Johnson Davis, want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Creative Conversations. I've been Morgan Appel, And I look forward to seeing you all in our next episode.